what for me is incredibly challenging is to let's say just go in underwear outside when it's super cold i don't know it's something where my body doesn't adjust that fast i always try to go on a, our rooftop and just being in underwear and it's very cold and uh, i feel like it's much tougher than jumping into a cold shower to be honest Showing off the goods to the neighbors, eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no, uh, actually, actually um, <laughs> what, what I've been doing as a break routine is that I go outside to my balcony and I take 10 really deep breaths. Mm. And at the same, this is going to sound stupid again to some, some listeners, but I'll look at the tree because, you know, looking at nature and just, just connecting with nature is a way to become mm. present back into the moment again. So if I'm playing an intense session, I'm, let's say, six hours in and I have some important tables, or even if I don't have any important tables, I think every table is important, then it's a, it's a good way to get back into the moment and, and to be crushing again, to be, you know, really focused because it's so intense yeah. that kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. And you only, have, you only have five minutes, so that's kind of the best way I see of using a break. Welcome to another podcast with Razor Edge. I'm Ben CB and my today's guest is European. Considered as one of the best poker players in the world, he's joining me today talking about how to become a poker pro, how to move through the different stakes, low stakes, mid stakes, high stakes. He is sharing his point of view on what population is doing wrong right now, how you can study your own game. But also we're going to talk about staking and the current state of online poker. So lots of different topics that we discussed in this episode. It's truly a lot of value being shared in this episode. So if you're an inspiring poker player and you want to become better and become a stronger mindset and also learn how you can study your own game, how you can find leaks and also find more happiness in your life because we also talked a lot about gratitude and finding balance in life. So a very, very high value episode. Make sure to watch it all. And if you truly enjoy this kind of podcast, then make sure to hit the like button and to subscribe. Really helps growing the channel and then enjoy the episode. All right, we're live. We're recording the podcast. Super happy to have Sam here. And um, I want to quickly jump into a topic that I think is not being talked a lot about. And most people don't really know how to apply a topic that is very important in life, which is gratitude. And Sam shared something very interesting uh, in his uh, in the poker community of BitB in Discord, where he shares his approach, his, his point of view about gratitude and uh, how he approaches it. And um, yes, yeah, Sam, tell us a little bit more. What What is your take on that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, since I've been a kid, I was brought up in a way that I was always, uh, I always had to be grateful for what I had and appreciate the very small things. So. I guess I was lucky in the sense that, you know, my parents, they gave me this kind of awareness from the very <clears> start. And, you know, just being able to appreciate the fact that we have clean water, we have a warm bed to go into every night, I think is something that brings you closer to what is important in life. So I think, you know, when it comes to life, and when it comes to what you want to get out of life, I think joy and having a joyful life is one of the biggest and most important things, at least to me. And when I'm grateful and I'm not just centering my attention on myself all the time and thinking like, how am I feeling versus how are other people feeling, you know, in the world and how are other people feeling in bit B? Like if I win, I want other people to win with me because the experience is, you know, it's, it's so much more greater when people win with you and you don't just win by yourself. <clears throat> So I think with gratitude, the way I practice it is I do meditation. I just, you know, sit down and I'm just thankful that, you know, I'm alive and I have another day, I have another breath to take. And I know to some viewers, they might be skeptical about this kind of thing, but I think it really, you know, at least for me, it really works. Obviously, we're all different individuals here, but I think the way, you know, a lot of people see life is that once you achieve X, Y, Z, once you get to this goal or you get a million dollars or whatever, that's when you're going to start to be happy. But actually the truth of that is that when you reach the million dollars or when you re reach this milestone, whatever it is, then you're still going to have these 
other problems that are going to be there. So if you can't feel gratitude in the process and just in the being of every day, like just in, you know, playing poker, playing a session, you know, just enjoying the fact that you have coffee mm. accessible to you and it tastes good. I mean, then you're just not going to be a very happy person. And, and I've experienced this in my own life. Like when I'm too self-centered, then <clears throat> I just get away from what's important in life. And um, yeah, I think those are like the main points that I brought up. And then I brought up a story where there's this uh, professor, this, this researcher from Harvard, and he goes to Africa to talk to some of the kids over there. And he went into school near Johannesburg where there was no electricity and no clean water. And, and he thought to himself, like, he can't, you know, tell them the same thing that he tells privileged Harvard kids or business leaders. So he started off with um, who here likes to do schoolwork, just like in a joking kind of manner. And to his, like, surprisement, actually 95% of the kids raised their hands and were smiling and enthusiastic about it. And, you know, that's obviously pretty surprising but yeah. they see it as a privilege because most of their parents didn't get to actually go to school and and learn the things they're able to learn now so they feel very lucky do you have certain certain beliefs or certain approaches like of course meditation but anything that outside um your your usual routine so let's say you have a bad poker session Do you apply any kind of maybe small or short visualization exercises where you visualize maybe that worse things can happen that changes your perspective and then you come back, okay, actually everything is fine. You know, especially as poker players, when we have a couple of bad sessions, we think we are the worst place in the world. We can't beat the game anymore. Uh, we, we, we suck shit. <laughs> we, we have to study for two weeks until we can back to the tables. Is there anything that you do personally in order to bring yourself back to maybe regain the confidence, also to bring back a bit more happiness and joy into your life? Yeah, um, quite a lot of things, actually, like a lot of basic things, though, like one thing what I'll do is I'll just take a really, really cold shower. So just okay. 10 minutes of max cold. And that <clears> is <throat> like that is really, really cold here in Finland. So <laughs> that and then while I'm in the shower, I'll just be thinking, you know, about the sit like about the, the present situation. So just like how it's feeling and, you know, just experiencing the present situation. And, and also, like another approach that I've had to poke nowadays is like taking it with a bit of humor, you know, like if I make some kind of a fuck up a big, big mistake on the tables. I think in the past, I used to beat myself up. I used to be thinking, like, what is this other reg thinking of me? What is the other, you know, seven players thinking about my play here? But life is too short, man. Life is too, it's too valuable to be letting other people, you know, uh, control your happiness and the way you feel about yourself. So if I make a mistake, I'll post it to Pads and Tommy. We have this group that we, we have together, like a Discord chat. And I'll laugh about it instead of being so serious. Obviously, I, I want to, you know, I feel pain at the same time. I feel some suffering and I want to get to the bottom of why I made the mistake that I made. But there's no point of like dwelling on it too much because it's you're not going to benefit from it anyway. You just that, that's that's my way of dealing with it anyways. And another thing I do is um, I'll go for a walk and just. You know, when it's like five, six in the morning here in Finland, it's it's pretty cold outside and there's people who are going to work and you can see that there's all these, you know, they look unhappy at least. And then you just get to realize like <clears throat> shit, you know, I'm out here. I can just go for a walk in the middle of the night. Like how fucking great is that? It's fucking amazing. Like and just go outside, just chill and just, you know, meditate, do whatever, maybe go fucking throw some loops or you know, what, what, whatever you want to do. And, yeah. and that kind of stuff is, is what I really appreciate. And I see these people go to work and a lot of people not so happy. And uh, it just makes me realize that I'm fucking lucky. And if uh, if I'm not appreciating and loving what I'm doing, then, you know, it's it's just, it's miserable. So that, I guess that brings me back really, really quickly. Yeah. And um, nowadays, I think it takes a lot to get me really far away from these things nowadays because I'm very sensitive on on just like other people and you know the things that I think are important in life yeah and I think it's also well, yeah sorry go ahead well, what, what about yourself 
Um, I, I really like your point about um, that it's also about others, that we enjoy celebrating happiness with others. It, it kind of sucks. Yes, you win something, but then all you're by yourself, you, you can't share it. So what I started, um, I would say around two years ago with my best buddy, he always gets a share of my profit. So he's basically staking me like for 5%. And because I realized actually when I started um, playing higher stakes tournaments, when I transitioned from sitting goals to tournaments, um, and uh, I, I was not really familiar with 100 big blinds, 75 big blinds, and um, I saw it a little bit of action. And I realized that I actually played good when I'm staked because I want the others to win as well, right? And that, that's nice. And when I then started playing basically always on my own, I feel like I didn't have the same focus and the same attention as I had when others had, even if it's just a couple of percentages. Mm -hmm. And I then started um, my buddy asked me, hey, is it also maybe possible? Can I buy some action on, on a regular basis? And I said, you know what? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And uh, I offered him like every Sunday and I made a YouTube video about this, this, this access sheet. And that's basically the sheet he's doing. He's putting all the tournaments in it, the 5%, and then we calculate the cut. So every single time he has 5%. And uh, this makes me, okay, I also, when I win, he wins as well. When I lose, I feel... Yeah, I feel the same way, but winning is, is it feels much better, and it gives me a, a higher level of focus when when I grind because I know then winning with someone else is is, is way more um, feels way better than if you would just do it for yourself. So um, for everyone that is grinding, if you just take one or two percent uh, of your winnings and donate it to charity or I don't know buy from the money maybe something small for your mom, you go to your mom, hey mom, you know what this month. If I if I make X Y Z amount of money, I buy you something nice, you know. Tell me what yeah, what is it? That's, you, you, that's really nice. And you have so much more power because we care about other people's happiness. Think about how often are we going uh, advice to others? You know, you should eat healthier. You should meditate. You should you should do workouts. But for ourselves, we're not necessarily so strict. You know, we're a bit more slacking. So because we care so much about our loved ones. So yeah. there is a way how you can incorporate that and, and kind of use it as a cheat, quote unquote, to make yourself work harder, be more present and try to achieve greater results. So I just ex discovered this by accident. And ever since we are redoing it every Sunday and uh, I, I feel in every session that I also want to win for him. This guy must be costing you a lot of money, Ben. Jesus this, no, I'm kidding, but this guy must be costing you a lot. Yeah, of money, unfor I unfortunately, yes. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's really nice. It, it it sounds like a really nice thing. I I wouldn't but, have made uh, so much money then. Pretty pretty sure. Like yeah, pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 exactly. I would have punted Actually, very Actually, uh, one of the reasons, like when I started out in poker, was you know one of my biggest goals right from the very get go was to buy my mom a house. Like that was one of the things that got me into playing poker really seriously because, you know, my mom, um, she was, she was, uh, you know, a single parent for a lot of my childhood and she was always taking care of me and my brother. And, and, you know, even though we had some, we had some tough times here and there, she always made sure that everything was amazing. Like, you know, I never, never realized that, that it was tough for her because she just, she was always happy. She was always putting in, you know, the work and, and she made me and my brother's life just absolutely amazing. And, you know, the amount of gratitude that I feel from that is just very, very intense. So obviously when, when you experience something like that, you want to give back. And um, that's one thing that I've been able to do with poker. And one of the things that I value the most is I've been able to help a lot of other people. And, um, you know, mostly people close to me, but also some, some, some charity and stuff like that. And, and uh, I, I think that's, you know, by giving without expecting anything back, that is what you, uh, what you end up receiving the most from yourself. So it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very selfish thing to do in the end of the day because you get so much good out of it yourself. It's selfish on the one side, but I think it, wouldn't be, it, it would be selfish actually not to do it because only when you are happy for yourself and you achieve something great, then you can give back. 
you can't give back if if you're if you're resentful if you feel miserable there's nothing to give apart from maybe then unleashing your anger onto others so you gotta for you gotta make sure to be happy and achieve your dream or goals first and then you can give back a lot mm -hmm. like way more yeah. right it's not saying that you 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 need to you, that you have to achieve this by being an asshole or douchebag and you know using your elbows but you can also achieve that by being a happy nice and friendly person a respectful person yeah. right so because i hear that very often you know you as a poker players they're selfish and they're arrogant and uh, they only take care about themselves but actually most successful poker player every single time i hear yeah i would like to give something back i would like to to do something some don't really know how but more often compared to other industries i have to say that i sense the urge of giving back at least having this um this willingness you know and uh i admire yeah, that I a agree lot from what i've seen as well i mean i i definitely agree with you i mean we had one guy in BitB, who most people actually out there probably know, Romeo Pro, who, yeah. you know, a lot of people loved, some people hated, <laughs> but uh, he, he had strong personality, but but obviously a very, very nice guy and, and one of the best in the game for sure. And he gave, I think it was 50% of his profits or something to charity and, and just that was incredibly inspiring. But I think to me, you know, donating to charities and stuff I need to I need to raise the awareness of myself I need to go to somewhere like Africa I need to do some voluntary work and then you know see how it feels and see the people because if I would just go online and, and donate like let's say 200k or whatever I'm not sure if I would I would feel that I'm doing the right thing or, or I, would, I would have concerns whether it's going to the right place and so yeah. on but in the future, like one of my big goals is definitely, you know, being able to give back a lot and not just to people around me, but to the whole world, because it's it's an amazing thing to do. And as we've been speaking about, you get so much out of it yourself. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have an advice for people that they get into poker and something I have been addressing now over the last weeks on, on, on Instagram and, and also occasionally my YouTube videos? for for finding deep meaningful goals for whatever you do whether it's poker okay let's say i want to get into poker i want to x make x y z amount of money or become in, uh, financially free but 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 what would be your approach what would be your advice to find goals that also make sure that you're not going to give up in the first downswing that you keep going because it really motivates you to keep going like this real intrinsic motivation you mean like poker related goals or life related goals? Or what a, no, not not poker, but let's say goals that make you play poker in the first place. So let's say one example would be to make more money. That's why you play poker. But of course, you can also make more money by building a business. Right. But making more money is not really a deep, meaningful goal. So the, maybe there is something else like, I don't know, for example, you, you also have to make more money to buy your mom a house so how did you find this goal how did you realize oh i'm actually so grateful for what my mom did i want to buy a house boom and then you have this connection and this emotions attached to this goal that make you keep going and if you have a lot of these goals chances you're not going to give up uh, are very high right so mm -hmm. how would you advise someone maybe that just started out poker or it can also be in business I, it doesn't matter but maybe let's stay with poker that to, to find these really deep, meaningful goals. So when, when it comes to goals, I actually have like a kind of love hate relationship with goals because at one point I was really into like goal setting and every month I was writing down what I'm going to be doing and, and the same thing for the year. And then I spoke a lot with uh, Elmerick, shout out to Elmerick, obviously one of my good friends and, and you know, one of the guys who I run BitB with, but I spoke to him quite a bit and I got his point of view and he was more like, you know, if you write these goals down and if you set these huge goals, then you already get the good feeling from writing all the stuff down and you don't actually execute on them. But obviously if you have the goals just for yourself, then it's less of a thing that you already experience a good feeling from just writing them down and, and thinking about them like that. But 
what I believe more in is I believe in the process. So I believe in, in ha setting up really, really good habits to succeed. And, um, you know, for me, that is going to the gym. It's staying healthy, eating, eating clean and, and good food. It's uh, interacting with, with smart and, and fun people. It's having some hobbies, having time with my friends, girlfriend, um, you know, having balance between poker and, 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 uh, and life. And I, and I think that's, that's been the best for me because nowadays I just, I have very, very good habits. I mean, I quit, you know, drinking, uh, start of uh, the end of last year. And I've been going back and forth with that for a long time now. And I know, again, this is like a controversial thing. You know, a lot of people listening will be like, what the fuck, this guy doesn't drink. Like, you know, but, but to me, it's the right thing. I'm not saying it's the right thing for everyone, but for me, it's the right decision not to drink because, you know, I, I have my own reasons for, uh, for, not, for not doing so. But I think just like developing really, really good habits is, is the way I achieve the biggest goals in my life. And I think just being present, living in every moment, and you know, leaving your past behind is is the way I like to live my life. So, I wouldn't say necessarily that I'm so focused on the future. I'm mm. more focused on just this present moment and always trying to make the best out of the the moment that we have and and trying to get everything that I need to get done. It doesn't mean that I don't have like goals for like the upcoming year or whatever. But it's more I'm focused on you know my my habits and just making sure that everything is in place that I can achieve everything that I'm trying to to go for. That makes sense. Absolutely, but don't you don't you think that you want to know roughly where it goes, your journey? Yeah, sure. But but like when it comes to you know my life right now, for instance, you know I don't I, don't, I have no idea how long poker is going to be around for. You know, some people estimate it's going to be around for two years. Other people are saying it's going to be around for longer. I'm an optimist, and I'm also very positive about the future of poker and and you know in general. So I'm not really thinking too far because I just want to focus on, you know, playing my best. I want to focus on giving my best bit B, doing my best when I'm coaching and also just being the best person that I can be. And I think for me, it, it makes sense to just focus on the present now because I can't really I can't really come up with a future plan when I don't know when it's going to be. You know, I can't predict the future. <clears throat> so to me, that makes the most sense in this current current situation. Yeah, so, so would you think it's more about it's having dreams? Of course, we all have dreams, right? And we want to make mm -hmm. sure that these dreams is something we want and not someone else, maybe society, your parents, or to impress other people. But it's more about the journey, like building a system, a system that will guarantee the highest chances of, of achieving your dreams and then just, you know, being open whatever comes up because you might adjust along the way you might realize all oh, this dream is actually nothing for me i actually want something else i have changed that throughout the years a lot i had very artificial dreams that i probably just wanted to achieve because it's was a thing that everyone tried to achieve um sure. so more about a system so you build uh, habits as you mentioned good habits that will just simply guarantee you to achieve your dreams and that very often it's more about or actually always it's more about the journey and the process because once you get there you want to start something else right um yeah because like right, right now you know i'm i'm trying to stay focused on just on just maximizing my evn poker i'm playing a lot of poker i'm playing you know tuesday thursday sometimes even even a monday and wednesday so i'm putting a lot more volume in than i've i've been putting in the last last couple of years and you know, there there isn't really other goals that I have <clears throat> related to uh, to to life apart from just wanting to, you know, like I have clear study goals. For instance, when it comes to poker, I have exact things that I want to get done within a certain time frame, and um, those are very motivating for me. But other than that, I don't really have too many goals because, like, going to the gym, it's just become a really strong habit. And you know, I've been injured for a little while now. Uh, recently, got back, but you know just just going to the gym working out with a personal trainer and then doing your own thing you know these few few times a week is so good for your mind and just your health and everything that uh it's it's just it's just that so i don't really need a goal to to motivate me that too much i just really enjoy it and i just enjoy every moment of it so what is but i, but I, I understand the other perspective of it too because i've been there as well i've been there with like 
big goals and, and having everything planned out. But now I'm just trying to be more present, I guess, more in the moment. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. What is European considered as one of the best players in the world now studying at the moment? What What are his studying goals? Um, it's a lot to do with with Pio and, and game theory and just, but it's it's more just understanding why you know Pio chooses to do what it what it does. And I think one of the questions that you brought up for this podcast was, what do I think you know the the, the average poker player is doing wrong, or, or what they could do to improve their game? And I think my answer to this would be how they study and how they use Pio, for instance, because I think from what I've seen, you know, in BitB and from what I've seen elsewhere as well, is a lot of people will take Pio, they'll put the Pio input. And then they'll go through it like it's some Bible and <laughs> yeah. be like, okay, this is the response and this is how Pio is playing. We want to do this and we want to do that. And I had King Jack off suit and, you know, it's raising half the time, folding half the time. So, you know, I raised, so it's, it's fine. It's a good play. Pio agrees with me. And this is a very easy way to, you know, just kind of lie to yourself if we're being completely honest here and just, and just not really see the whole picture. But the way I use the way I like to use Pio is like let's say <clears throat> we play buttonmost big blind and it's a six full two tone, and the button goes for range bet on the flop, we go for call on the big blind, and the turn is a king, uh, Badugi king, so not bringing uh, bringing a second flush draw or not completing the flush, and um, we check and villain bet seventy five percent on the turn. Sorry for the strategy, by the way, but it's just. Kind of trying to prove my point. So, um, villain bets again, and this is a spot where you know the imposition player is supposed to bet a lot of good kings, and he's also supposed to start checking with a lot of like queen ten, jack ten, queen jack. You know these these gut shot hands on the turn because they have some showdown value um, given how wide the the big blind is supposed to defend against the buttons one third or, or one fourth C, but whatever it is. So they have some showdown value. They can improve to the nuts. They really don't want to be bet folding against check raise. And um, but but the way you know people actually play this spot is that it's it's a lot of level one thinking. Like the king is really good for their range. So they're basically on this turn they bet all their bluffs or most of their bluffs, and they don't bet these king queens, king jacks, king tens, and these hands they should be betting for value as well. So essentially what ends up happening is they just have a really polarized and really, you know, overbluffed range. And <clears throat> when you study the spot a little bit deeper, you can see that as the out of position play, you can start to call with pretty much all of your six X and four X. If you think the population is not going to overbluff the river, which they probably are not going to be doing if they're thinking because the population is already overfolding the top. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> so I think this is, this is the way I like to study, you know, going deep into it and looking at different nodes and just learning exploits against the population, understanding why Pio decides to do what it does. Because like, let's say on this King turn, <clears throat> a hand like Ace-9, especially if it's it's the flush draw. So if, if, if there's double flush draw, if it's the King of, uh, so it's Ace-6-4, two diamonds and a spade. If the turn is the King of spades, you know, Ace-9, is playing as a check shove when it doesn't block the flush draws. But when you go deeper into it and try to understand why is ace nine check shoving here, it is because the imposition player is supposed to bet call with hands like king queen, king jack, king ten. Once you remove these from the equation and, and he's not actually bet calling these hands, then you realize that it would be actually be way better as just a check call. Yeah. Because you keep in all these really low non equity hands, mm. which you know, obviously, first of all, are going to sometimes bluff the river. Second of all, they just they can't improve against against your top pair, and you can't actually get it in with the amount of equity that you have when they don't bet these king x hands to begin with, and, and you know never bet call them. Hmm. So I think that's that's the way I like to study in general is to try to find these spots and try to understand why we're doing what we're doing instead of just you know putting the information in there and just trying to like satisfy my beliefs and, and my play and make myself feel good that I didn't make a mistake here because Pio told me, told me it's okay. Yeah. So essentially what you're trying to say is that 
whenever you are studying, it's important that you understand why we want to do th certain things, right? Yeah, so, I think that's that's the that's the main way that yeah. I study is I always try to understand. So I can spend you know three four hours on just a single tree, just trying yeah. to understand why we're doing what yeah. we're doing. Yeah, and uh, and you can mirror this knowledge also onto others just because someone copy paste 20 hand interests in Pyro and sees 20 results, you probably end up having a much better understanding if you analyze one hand thoroughly from with several different nodes, maybe a tighter flop seabed strategy, a more aggressive flop seabed, seeing different outcomes, start recognizing patterns, how you can start making exploits, you'll be able also to mirror that onto others. And I always encourage everyone, whenever you study try to take those two three minutes and try to explain whether it's maybe you study with a buddy or you just explain it onto the air uh, what you just learned as if you're teaching this to someone else okay we are going to yeah. defend this range because of reason abc and then on the turn we're going to do this because i think population is not going to do it uh, the way pyro is suggesting it i mean for you and me it's a little easier because we are coaching on a regular basis so whenever I prepare my content and I look into something, I have to make sure that I explain it in a way that people can understand it and also incorporate that in their way, no, uh, in their game, no matter how complicated things are. And once I also started coaching more often, I actually realized I learned so much more and I can, I can, uh, I can incorporate the, the concepts much easier into my game than just having this theoretical knowledge. And I'm pretty sure that there's so many out guys out there that are so much better in theory than me and they can probably um, give me much better strategies for flop turn river but the stuff that i look into i can i can incorporate 100 percent, and i follow up on that and yeah. i'm and i see it every day still and i'm preaching it and i'm i'm slowly getting tired of it telling people in discord hey instead of just you know looking into the the game tree or the results try to understand it does it really make sense does population play like this even if you don't have a read on your opponent, try to think about if this is realistic. Try to think on average in the vacuum and then make your yeah. decisions yeah, exactly. on that. I'm not, and I'm not saying, you know, this A6 for king spot is the way we should play against every player that we should just pull a 6 x and 4 at a time. And I'm not saying, you know, that, that against someone who's playing a bit more <laughs> of a solid strategy that we should just go that crazy with our assumptions. But I think, you know, poker in the end of the day, it's an assumption game. And you have to be aggressive with your thought process. You can't just be, you know, scared of making a mistake. Like I've, as I, as I said before, like I've made some big mistakes when it comes to poker. I've made some big assumption mistakes, but I've also made some really, really good assumptions. And you have to trust your assumptions. You have to, you have to not be scared that you're going to fuck up. And even, even if you look stupid to everyone else, you just have to have the confidence somewhere deep down that it's the right play and you believe in it because you've studied the spot. And if you make the mistake, then at least you have something to learn from, you know, you have something to go back and study, which is also exciting if you if you can see it from that perspective. Yeah, especially exciting on a big final table where you lose a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real, but yeah. what, what was your biggest mistake? What was your biggest misplay, if you want to share? It? I mean, I've, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes in in past that i can think of like there was this one hand that i played in in 25k against uh, a weaker player where i decided to it, it was it was it was a ridiculous play but but it's kind of ridiculous because you know what, I, what i've come to realize is is something which i think has the biggest impact on your play at least for me is sleep so i i just I wasn't very well rested at the time and i think sleep has just such a big impact but it was just very spewy pre-flop play like it was three bet to, to five bet with a hand that should just never be in there you know so and and it's it's one of those plays that I'm, I'm sure you know a lot of us have made made many times before but uh there's there's so many mistakes that i've made and continue to make that it's just it, we would we would have to spend this whole call talking about them and you would end up being my therapist in the end and i would be sitting here you know laying down like this and, and uh yeah so about, let's about, start about this session <laughs> no but i i think you know we're always going to make mistakes like every session that i play i make mistakes but i think the most important point is to learn from them and to be able to to study them afterwards and and be aggressive with your assumptions like 
don't try to satisfy your beliefs or, or satisfy your ego. Just, yeah. just try to not be uh, attached to what your beliefs are and, and you know, to playing correctly or, or just, just, just be very, very aggressive in that <laughs> sense is, is what I think is, is the right approach. Do you think that we have been talking about solvers? Do you think solvers should be used for mid and high? Uh, sorry, for low and mid stakes. Maybe if we start with low stakes, do you think it's a necessity as a tool to study with? Well, so the way I the way I use solvers, as I, as I already explained, is to understand why. So I think you know if you can do that, and if you can you can have the confidence and, you know, belief in yourself and also understand how to use them, then I think it can definitely be beneficial. Okay. Because, you know, for instance, another example is like 40 big blinds under the gun opens, flop is 9742 tone, we call him the big blind again. And in position goes for, like he mainly uses bigger bets on this board texture and checks. And he goes for bigger bet. And we're in the big blind with a hand like 97. And to understand why we don't want to be fast playing nine seven on the flop most of the time in, you know, in in like a GTO or like let's say against someone who's playing optimal strategy, why we don't want to be fast playing a hand like that is is super valuable to understand because it just it makes you understand you know the equities and it makes you understand you know, like just how, like it just gives you a deeper understanding of the game. And that's what I'm trying to look for when I'm studying is trying to get a deep and deep understanding of the game and get to the point where it's so deep where you don't need to look at, you know, 187 flops or whatever. You just look at a few flops and you understand these principles that you can take away and use on any flop on in any spot. And you just understand the, the mechanics that you need to use to really yeah. play very good, solid and uh, strong poker. So I, I, I would say it, it is it is useful for sure. If you use it the right way. But let's say yeah. someone plays ten dollar average limit uh, tournaments across all sites. What would, what would be your advice for someone like that who yeah to, to, to focus on mainly focus on to improve the game, um, and yeah to, trying to to move up as quickly as possible. I mean I think very clearly you know when you when you're starting in poker like. Gaining the most experience is, is key. So, so grinding. playing, putting in the repetitions and Reps. and having a good, you know, having a good community around you. So having like one or two guys who you can discuss hands with and discuss ideas and make sure that your thought, thought process is, is good and solid and also make sure that you're challenged because uh, I think a lot of people, they what what they do is they get people around them who have the same belief system like in bit b you know we have we all pretty much have the same belief system because we've just been ingrained together we've been together for so long that we've just started to you know have the same kind of thoughts when it comes to poker a lot of us and i think that's dangerous because mm -hmm. i think it's it's good to have someone with a complete different perspective and that's why we try to get new coaches we try to get you know new people to just join in and, and have a completely different approach so we can be like aha like, yeah, yeah, this yeah. guy actually approaches a, a spot in a completely different way and it makes so much sense but we've just been ingrained to thinking in a certain way which you know i think can be dangerous so i think that's that's very important for someone who's upcoming to have people that are better than them that they study with and also people who are worse than them because you know if, if you're the top player like let's say you're one of the best players in the world you can also learn something from the guy who's the third best player in the world. Like he's going to be doing things better than you guaranteed that you can learn from as well. Yeah. So being able to understand you can learn from someone who's better and someone who's weaker than you, I think is also very valuable. Yeah. Being very open-minded, obviously. And you can also learn from someone who just started. Um, I, I had a, I, I met a very good friend of mine, who just went into poker, he quit his job. Of course, he saved up money already several months ahead so he can dedicate his time full time to try it out for one year. And he has been hesitant for quite a while. And he always came to me, Ben, how should I do it? Part-time tournaments. And I said, listen, part-time tournaments, when you have a full-time job, it's not gonna work out. You mess up your sleep. Uh, if you finish your tournaments, you're not gonna be able to fall asleep right away. As we both know, it had hands gonna be had in your in your head that you're thinking about and you're you're doubting your decisions. And 
So ultimately, he made the decision at the end of last year. Okay, I quit my job. I saved enough expense. I saved enough money for one year, and he starts on low stakes. Today, I met him, and he got into because he also asked me what should I do, and I said, listen, make some posts in Discord, try to build a study group. Um, of course, I also help him as much as I can, but he doesn't obviously doesn't want to bother me as much as he as he uh, as he wants, and yeah, then he got to know got introduced to some poker players here in Austria and today we met and he said Ben listen what I have learned in this one week from these guys I would have never learned in one year like you could see the fire in his eyes he was like I want to go back playing like well he had so much confidence and this realized me and that's why I just brought up that you can also learn from people who just started reminded me to keep pushing out this message that reminds me of what is important right And it's not always yeah. necessary that you ne learn new knowledge or new exploits that you can make, but just this fire from someone who just started and he sees how these concepts work in practice, that's just amazing. Yeah. And I'm gonna go out there and on Instagram and yell people in their faces on Instagram stories to go and uh, uh, search for some poker buddies because it is important. And he has skipped, he has saved himself six months of working on his own, trying to find the leaks that three poker buddies told him one session, hey, you need to work on this, you're doing this wrong, work on this, work on this, work on this. Boom, six months skip. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah that's, that's extremely beneficial for sure. Nice. Yeah, and, and, and it, it just is a bit of grind, you know, like putting yourself out there, posting in forums, posting there, like seeking for buddies. You will also meet a lot of people that are not a match and you might need to abandon, you move out, you move on. And then ultimately you will be able in a group of people that, or you end up in a group of people that are very, very helpful for your journey. And uh, I can't emphasize on that enough. So yeah, poker. I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what is your, what do you think uh, for, because we now talked a little bit about low stakes players, but of course we, there are also a lot of mid stakes players out there. What, what do you think, what should they do to move up to high stakes? Or what do most peer players fail at when they try to move to high stakes? So I think one thing that I think is, is something that I had a lot of problems with uh, when I was upcoming at some point was dealing with adversity. So, you know, when you make these big fuck ups on, on a final table or, or you know, when, when you have a bad few sessions or whatever, being able to deal with that and staying strong and continuing to play good poker, even though things are not going your way, I think is the most valuable skill. Like, you know, someone who is, let, let's say we have someone who is more talented, more skillful, just better at poker than you. It doesn't matter. Like if he's better, more talented and all these things, like he just understands poker better than you. If he can't execute, so if he can't, you know, mentally, get his mind mm. to perform and, and use the knowledge that he has, he's never going to be the better win, like the bigger winner. The guy with the better mental game is always going to outlast this guy. If you take a year, two years, the guy with the better, better mental game is always going to end up being the most profitable. So I, I would say that working on your mental game is, is the most important. Having a balance in your life. So as, as we've already been talking about, like not being so self-centered, on like how you're doing but actually having the awareness that there's other people in this world there's your friends your family not getting disconnected from your community when you're doing poorly because it's easy you know when you're winning when you when you when everything is going well it's very easy to just be be happy and to be connected with all these people when things going when, when things are going really bad what i what i see myself doing at times too is i disconnect from everyone else so i'm not replying to let's say my family, you know, their messages on WhatsApp, just taking like a few extra days to reply to them or, you know, w whatever else, like in, in some kind of way, I'm like kind of disconnected from it all because I'm so focused mm. on myself that I get detached from what's actually important in life. Yeah. And then when you get back, you take a day off and you realize like shit, you know, like haven't replied to my mom for a few days or, or my brother, then I'm like shit, like these are the things that matter the most. And if poker is going to take that away from me, then I have to find more balance in my life. And that's when I've always taken a step back and I've been like, hey, like I have to really, you know, I have to really focus on the things that are important to me again. 
So I think for someone trying to trying to get up the limit, trying to reach high stakes is 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 have balance. That's that's probably the, the biggest thing. And then the second second thing is um, have have the belief. Like you have to believe in yourself. You have to have that confidence, no matter what happens, that you're going to make it. Like you, it, it doesn't matter if no one else believes in you. If your parents have told you like. It, like poker is is you know it's it's for gamblers it's it's not something you can make a living with if you want to fucking make it you have to have a belief that just it just doesn't die no matter what comes your way like no matter what obstacle comes you just you just see that you go through it you know so i think with anything like like with anything that you want to succeed at belief is is one of the most important and then we talked about you know having a community having really good people around you like i have you know, you guys, I have, I have Tommy and Pad who have always been there for me. If I've had tough times, I've always been able to share anything that's been happening, both in my life and in poker with them. And they've been supportive and they've been, you know, they've been lifting me up. And that that's huge because if you go through all of that yourself, it's tough. You don't, you don't have anyone who can, who can just relate to you or who can just help you through that. So I, I would say that just finding balance, dealing with adversity, that's the biggest things, and also just mm. having the belief, trusting yourself, even when things don't go right. Is the is the balance also for you something that helps you to, <clears throat> yeah, to to maintain your focus because you know I know you as someone who grinds a lot, you study a lot, you have bit B stable management managing, and I know for myself how how. Um, time investing it can be creating content for your guys um, coaching them yeah. and then you probably also have a lot of individual calls to cheer them up then you also in a relationship you are you know you're going into the gym how, how do you able to <clears throat> yeah to organize all that to maintain your focus and not get overwhelmed by too many tasks or obligations I, I, think, I think personally I could be I could be better at organizing my stuff um, I think definitely I have, have some improvement to make that, but I, I, I do think that, you know, the humoristic side of life is the way I kind of balance out all the stuff that I have to take care of. So like today, you know, I was up still like 6 AM and, uh, my girlfriend had just woken up and she was in like, she was in a sleepy kind of whatever mood she made breakfast. And then I just, uh, I put some music on, so I put like because she she likes Celine Dion and it's kind of catchy song you know it's like everyone knows it 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 it, it arises some some good emotions in you like I, I don't even like necessarily like the the music so much but it's just like I read it from a habit book that it just arises certain emotions and it just is it's very catchy so anyways I put it on and then I just started dancing with her you know and uh just I, i'm a terrible dancer by the way like one of the worst i have no kind of sense of rhythm and it we, we've been to salsa a few times and we're just fucking terrible but but this kind of thing you know small thing we did five minutes of just dancing and and like she's not the best dancer either but it was it was fucking fun you know she not better watch really this podcast time. what she better not watch this podcast no she she's better than me like she's she's way better than me obviously but um uh, But yeah, it was it was fun and, and that kind of stuff like that makes me realize how good life is and that makes me realize how unimportant you know all the unnecessary suffering and pain you cause yourself and that makes all the tasks and everything that you have to get done a lot easier because it's it's more motivating when you have stuff like that in your life that that balances out all the stress and and all the stuff that you just have to get done uh, on a tight schedule. So uh, I guess that would be like one of the ways that I, I like to, you know, disconnect kind of thing. And, yeah. Any advice you can uh, give to manage a professional poker career and a relationship at the same time? Um, or oh, no, not just manage. I, I think this sounds so bad, more like maintaining a happy, great uh, relationship where both can grow and not just You know, maintaining a relationship means uh, uh, sounds so like, yeah, being together for the sake of being together. But you appear to me as someone who seems to be very happy. So uh, you must be doing something right. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, 
so I'm not not an expert, obviously, but I, I, I think just, you know, making time, like just making sacrifices, like my girlfriend for me, she makes a lot of sacrifices and she helps a lot with certain things that I don't necessarily have time for. But the way we live life is it's very equal. Like, you know, I know some people, they and, and like no problems to them, you know, people have different values and stuff. And I'm not saying it's the wrong way to do things, but you know, a lot of people, you know, that their, their girlfriend does most of the things for them. But the way we've always gone about things, we do things very equally. And like when it comes to cooking and stuff like that, you know, cleaning, whatever else needs to be done, we're always doing stuff like mainly 50 50. So it, it's nice because that just just keeps things equal and it keeps you humble and stuff and it, it would be wrong if it would be any other way at least in my opinion based on my beliefs but i think to maintaining a happy relationship i mean you have to make time for the other person you have mm. to make sacrifices like you know if there's there's a day you want to play but you realize that your relationship is not you know thriving at the moment or she really wants to spend time with you then you're gonna have to like go to some ev and spend the time with her because in the end that's the most important thing right yeah how do you how do you um whether it's with her or something on your own to to spend time in a more pleasant way let's say hobbies or doing more stuff for fun let's say is there something that you do on a regular basis yeah so as i said like like me and her together we uh we started dancing salsa We started the last year. That, that was a lot Is of fun. Is there any footage from that? Because, what? Is there any footage? You would answer? I mean, I can show you some moves, but I'm not going to do it here on the podcast. You know, I'm <laughs> going to keep it somewhat uh, professional. But but anyways, it's... Uh, yeah, well, what I was talking about, it's... it's um, That kind of stuff is really fun because it gets you out of your comfort zone. It, it makes you laugh about yourself and realize that, <clears throat> you know, it's 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 just a bit of fun life like and, and it's also such a good time because she's laughing you're laughing and just just having fun without any goal you're just you're just doing something fun together and um other stuff that we do i mean you know sometimes go to the gym or go to the movies or you know what whatever like uh, a lot of times go into nature and just go for a walk or um what one thing that we do like twice a week now is uh we we go swimming in the in the ice water basically oh so uh you know the the wim hop mm. and stuff mm. and Sick. um actually her sister recommended it to us at, at some point last i think it was like one and a half years ago and then since then i've been pretty addicted to it because i i've been taking cold showers for like the last probably two years and um I think it's just so good for your mind. It, it brings you back into the moment, basically, and that's that's what I'm always trying to be is, is in the moment. Um, other than that, you know what what I do? I, I go play. Uh, have you heard of paddle? No. It, it's it's like tennis, but it's uh, a little bit different because the court extends to the back walls and the side walls. Okay. So it's it's anyways it's it's a really fun it like high squash? tempo game. Is it like squash? It's it's like it's like a combination of squash and tennis, basically. Okay. That, that's yeah, that makes it of fun. Yeah. I, I I've been going with uh with my cousin who lives here in the city that I live in, and then two of our like mutual friends, and it's 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 amazing because uh you know again that just gets you outside of things and <clears> just <throat> you're just spending some time you know playing a game and it's uh it's good fun. I also play futsal on two teams and that, that's also just just great fun i really enjoy that as well um you're you're, you're a pretty good football player as well uh, from from budapest you're, you're, you're quite, quite quite the diver <laughs> <laughs> that's that's outrageous we're gonna cut this out oh my god that was one of the most brutal fouls i've ever experienced in my career and i'm being accused as a diver that's ridiculous Oh, oh my god <laughs> yeah that was really fun that was really fun yeah. have you have you ever considered attending a, a Wim Hof uh, boot camp that he's doing in, in I think in Netherlands Poland and I've seen he's also doing a Kilimanjaro boot camp where they hike up the Kilimanjaro I guess in underwear and, and then all the way back uh, have you ever considered attending one of his boot camps 
Um, not not right now, actually. I've just just so so much other stuff to do that yeah. I've just kind of been focused on this stuff. But I mean, I, I, if if there's people who are up for it, like you know, whenever Tommy or or pads or you or someone is up to something like this like i'm always up to I, I talked with james about it he, he messaged me and uh, i was like yeah but uh, most of the it would probably be then the end of the year um but yeah we we talk about it yeah and so i would i would definitely be in i mean if there's <clears> people who are going yeah definitely. i have to say that shoring caught and i was in iceland also swimming in the ice water and it, it it's hard it's always hard but i feel like your body gets faster used to it but what for me is incredibly challenging is to let's say just go in underwear outside when it's super cold i don't know it's something where my body doesn't adjust that fast i always try to go on uh, our rooftop and just being in underwear and it's very cold and uh, i feel like it's much tougher than jumping into a cold shower to be honest Sh showing off the goods to the neighbors eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, no uh, actually, actually um <laughs> what, what i've been doing as a break routine is that I go outside to my balcony and I take 10 really deep breaths. Mm. And at the same, this is going to sound stupid again to some, some listeners, but I'll look at the tree because, you know, looking at nature and just, just connecting with nature is a way to become mm. present back into the moment again. So if I'm playing an intense session, I'm, let's say, six hours in and I have some important tables, or even if I don't have any important <laughs> tables, I think every table is important then it's a, it's a good way to get back into the moment and, and to be crushing again, to be, you know, really focused because it's so intense yeah. that kind of experience. Yeah, yeah. And you only have you only have five minutes, so that's kind of the best way I see of using a break. I like stretching. Well, what, 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 what do you do in, in your breaks? Oh, f f what has changed for me is I, I read it in, in a book somewhere that the way our brain works is... Um, even if you take breaks and let's say you grind and then you have a break and what most people do is like take their phones and then check social media. And what we don't understand is whatever you occupy your brain with, we might not be consciously aware of. So when, whenever you scroll through a feed, your brain still keeps working. It judges whether should you click this link, should you like it, should you open this page or not. So you're still using resources from your brain that doesn't allow your brain to recover, to recharge your battery. So instead, do something where you can recover your brain as you focus on your breath. Just be present with you. Even though you have this inner monkey telling you, okay, let's do something fun, let's check Facebook, or let's just watch a three-minute cat video on YouTube, you know, you think you recover more, but you actually don't. And uh, this actually was really eye-opening for me because, yes, it makes sense. Of course, you keep... You keep interacting with whatever you're doing and you waste resources what even if it's just one or two percent but these one or two percent might be missing in the next big pod that you're not able to connect the dots or also when you go outside <clears throat> and you take a walk if you take a walk in a city you still have to pay attention to the traffic to the traffic lights you're not going to be able to recover as well as as if you would take a walk in nature where you can really focus on yourself you can center yourself bring your inner awareness back and then come fully rested back. Not maybe necessarily fully rested, but way more rested if you would take a walk in the city. So yeah. for me, very often what actually helps is just understanding how we work. And then I'm, I'm st of course, sometimes, you know, you, you have a, this hour didn't go well and then just like, fuck it. Like this guy caught me sure. down again with bottom pair in a pot where I have Trizil nuts and I have one combo that I ended up bluffing and he still calls me down. You're like, Ah, and then you take your yeah. phone, you just, you know, you're not very aware. But but then after a minute or two, I realize, okay, hey, chill, relax, do a stretch for one or two minutes and then keep going. It's, you, you're able to pull yourself out of this autopilot much faster if you constantly just distract yourself with, with random bullshit. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, I see it very, very, very similarly. And, and I think one thing like that I think is important for the listeners and especially the guys who are trying to move up the stakes is that you know a lot of the times or something and let's not say a lot of the time but sometimes you're going to have these sessions where you just realize you're playing really bad right like you we both had these sessions where we just it's an off session we're just not able to focus we're not able to play our best game 
And what I used to do in the past was I used to beat myself up. I used to, you know, go on, go on tilt. I used to just spew off my stacks. And obviously sometimes still I'm going to make some, some spews and some mistakes and so on. But I think the most important thing in those kind of situations, again, is being able to realize the situation, uh, you know, for what it is, and then mm. being able to play slightly better than yeah. you played the last time this kind of situation occurred. Yeah. So being able to just still accept the moment and just perform a little bit better than you did, you know, let's say two weeks <clears> ago <throat> when this happened the previous time. And this is going to save you lots of money. This is going to also save you a lot of stress because you know, if you if you end up just spewing off all your stacks and just end up being like, fuck, fuck it, I give, give up kind of thing, you're going to go to bed feeling, you know, sad, you're going to be feeling, you know, uh, dissatisfied with yourself. But if you can pull through it, and if you can be like, you're still going to man up, you're still going to be, you know, tr try to be as, as good as you possibly can, then you're going to be able to go, in, go to bed feeling satisfied and yeah. feeling proud of yourself. And, and you know, the attempt that you had to still try to save it even though it was uh, like really really tough mentally yeah yeah it's not about from spewing your stack off and destroying your session from being a zen in the next session it's not going to happen like this is just 10 percent better 15 percent better five percent better and sometimes it's just quitting earlier, not ending up trying to chase winnings, especially for those who play sit and goes and cash games in tournaments. Sometimes you cannot just finish your session uh, midway, your, uh, midway in your session, but um, this is all already improvement. And sometimes you make a slight, um, uh, slightly more mistakes than last time and you fall back a little bit, but then next time again, 5% better. And then it's like, it's like a poker graph, you know, it's like boom, boom, boom. But over yeah, the long yeah. run, you, you improve. And so many people yeah, try to, I, I, yeah, I, go ahead. I think, think that's just one of the most important things because, you know, it's, it's obviously, it's very obvious when we speak about it like this, but in the moment, it's, it's really tough to actually do and to yeah. execute. And, and I think one more thing going out to these you know, to the listeners that are, that are trying to move up the stakes is, is actually we all are like I'm, I'm in my own game trying to, you know, constantly be better and, and move up the stakes is also to sometimes just appreciate, mm -hmm. you know, your, your current skill level to appreciate how things are right now and not <clears throat> always be looking to get to that next level, even though improvement is, is important and it's really good to keep moving forward. It's also important to just stop, you know, be still for a minute realize like shit like things are really good you know like you, like even use the past a little bit to just be like wow like now you know we started from the, this level and now we're here like yeah. it's amazing and take a moment to just be happy about that yeah. because so often i feel like we just go through life <clears throat> just trying to reach constantly reach that next level trying to trying to be happy because we we got to that like for instance, this year, I think a lot of the high stakes guys have the goal to make a million dollars. And, you know, when you have that kind of a goal, it's easy not to take the enjoyment in just every session, but be fixated on when you make that million, you're going to be happy instead of just enjoying, <clears throat> you know, every little bit of the session and stuff. And that, that I think is when you're going to play your best poker. Yeah. I find it a very stupid goal, to be honest. It's good. It's a good dream. It's a, it's a, it's like a wish, you know, it's something you, you have no control of. There are still other mm -hmm. factors that decide whether you want to make the 1 million or not. And then again, it brings yeah. us back what we discussed earlier, build a system around it that exactly. make it very likely yeah. that you achieve the million, but don't make it a goal. The goals are yeah, basically yeah. the journey and the million is just a wish or a dream. And if you see it more like a wish or a dream, you're not getting so attached to it because, because as we know, dreams and, 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 and wishes, it, they're not in our control. They're a little bit more magical or a bit more mystical. And this is something that will appear when you put in the work and you put in the right steps and you make on average good decisions. But even if you do so, there's no guarantee that you will accomplish it. And I think that's also a little bit of a, a mindset problem for a lot of people that actually work a lot and work really hard and then they don't achieve it and then they hate themselves for it, even though they did actually everything right along the way. And yeah. This this is not something we we should strive for. If you think about yeah yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, but I think I think the reason that it's been like a topic of subject is that uh, you know now nowadays with how high the stakes are, like you know yeah, you're probably yeah. playing average buying of one thousand two hundred, one thousand five hundred. I'm playing very similar. It's crazy actually how much EV <clears throat> you can print in a year playing online poker, and and I think you know if if we move a little bit towards what you want to discuss as well, like the current state of poker. I think a lot of people don't realize just how good it is at high stake. Like, I, I, I agree that, you know, a lot of the games have gotten worse. And to be able to be successful, you have to be better, you have to be studying more, you have to be putting in more time and the win rates are lower. But at the same time, the opportunity that you have, the potential that you have for success, and if, 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 if you were to measure which a lot of people do and and i think you know is is you kind of have to in poker is how much ev and how much money you can make in a year it's crazy like at high stakes it's fucking crazy how much you can make if you put in the time and you you grind let's say three thousand tournaments at average buying one thousand two hundred it's it's ridiculous Mm. so if if we move on to that topic a little bit i the way i see it is i think it's if you're able to make the transition to high stakes poker and you're able to beat the games at a high win rate, then it's it's like the opportunity is just endless for you. Yeah, I'm actually a little bit surprised because so many people are complaining about the current situation and I like your approach. And this is something I've also always been saying, listen guys, if you think poker sucks, if you think poker is rigged, if you think the games are not beatable, then just don't play it and do something else. There's no point in constantly, um, <clears throat> yeah, being resentful and complaining about it on social media and comments or wherever, um, or do something about it, right? Um, it's, it's hard to do something about it, but and then the only thing you can do is not to play. But if you play it, then, then live with it, deal with it, <clears throat> or draw your consequences. But of course, nothing is perfect, right? I think we both agree on that. What would you do? What do you think what needs to be done not only to um, make it better but also to guarantee a sustainable um, economy on uh, economy for online poker well you know like I, I I've been speaking some to poker stars Luke and you know I, I think he for instance has good intentions like I know there's a lot of haters and I know you know there's there's a lot of people who disagree with with lots of the stuff stars has, has done and and I definitely disagree as well like for sure I am not with stars or, or have, have anything going or whatever but I've just spoken to the guy and I think he has good intentions and he wants to do what is right by the players but I think it's tough to execute when you don't have someone who's actually playing the game there so like I think what needs to be done is you need to hear more from the players. You need to just, you know, like listen to someone who's playing four days a week and ask them how they feel about the current schedule, how they feel about, you know, the, the breaks and, and all this kind of stuff. So I think getting someone's perspective who actually lives the life as a, as a professional poker player and as a recreational player too, like how do the recreationals yeah. think about the game? Because obviously they're, 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 they're very important and their enjoyment of the game is is very important like I think you know we all started out as recreationals at some point so if, if we want to have people who are upcoming and, and can have that dream of reaching you know going from low stakes to high stakes and and making that dream possible then we need to make it fun for the recreationals too and we need to make that dream believable and I, and I think, you know, listening to them and listening also to the guys who actually play the game is, is the most important way to get valuable feedback. Because right now, you know, you have these guys, um, I, I don't know how they how they do it exactly, but you have, you know, guys at, at SARS, for instance, who, who, don't, who can't be aware of how, how we see things. Because there is some communication, but it's not totally that. Mm. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. What what in what in particular is something that you would like to see to change, not only in poker stars but also in party poker or maybe on specific sites, <clears throat> apart from the communication? Is it schedule wise, rake rise, guarantees, rebuys, reentries? What's what's your take on that? You know, it's 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 really tough for me because I'm always I've always been an optimist. 
Mm -hmm. I've always been very, like trying to be very positive at the moment and trying to just, because, you know, I, I feel like I don't have a real impact on the situation. Like I tried to, to go through things with uh, Luke and, and tried to make some changes with him, with, with Elmerix, but it's, it's tough, you know, because Luke as well, he only has so much power. Like he only has so much that he can actually do from his side. So even if he wants to make the changes, there's still people in stars who have, you know, the mm. final decision. Yeah. So it's it's tough for someone like him to actually to actually decide what like even if he thinks it's gonna be a lot better for the players, it's tough then to make the final decision. Um and, and obviously like I'm again I'm no expert. I don't know exactly how it works. But yeah. That's just my understanding of the topic. But it's it's tough for me to kind of discuss this in great detail because I'm so appreciative of the chance that I have for yeah, to yeah. play high stakes and I, I think that the potential there is incredible for uh, anyone who's like at mid stakes or lower stakes and trying to reach high stakes. I think the games are the games are obviously tough. The competition the competition is tougher than ever, but I think the potential is definitely there. Yeah, and and, and I think it comes down to yourself. You know whether you're ready to. To put in the time and the effort to make it if i can make it anyone else can make it like i'm you know i'm only human you're only human if we can make it other people can make it too certainly and yeah. by the way I, I don't mean that i've made it or anything i'm, I'm trying to develop and, and progress all the time but you know just just be be at high stakes for uh, a consistent amount of time and just continue to crush and win at the games is, yeah is what i meant but um yeah, I mean, I, I obviously think, you know, uh, that there's, there's some of the stuff that, that could be improved that comes to mind is just, like, m making it more appealing for players. So maybe getting, like, you know, some some kind of benefit for starting tournaments. Like, now we have the, the 1K warm-up or <clears throat> these 530 tournaments where there's just, like, you know, regs forced to start the tournaments because otherwise they don't really run. Hmm. And it would be nice if if there would be some kind of incentive to start them but i think that's also a tough thing to do from star's side because obviously they have costs and all that other stuff and it's not not something <clears throat> that sites are really doing i think there's one site that does it like if you start the tournament you get to play rake free i'm not sure if it's is it gg or is it is it some other site i'm, I'm not really sure <clears throat> which, which site it is but uh well you get benefits some, for some starting point. tournaments yeah I, I think there's something like this going yeah, on. Yeah, I've heard about this. Well, yeah. I think it wasn't for cash game. Wasn't? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, not. I think it was for sure. cash game. Uh, maybe even run it once. Or party. Yeah, but there, there was for sure a site that rewarded players to start action. Yeah, which I yeah, yeah I agree with. Yeah, it's good. But but again, it's it's just I I feel like it's tough for me because I do see like. The schedule nowadays is just like it's it's so at least for high stakes players it's so great maybe maybe for the guys who play mid stakes and lower stakes it's tougher because you know if we think about let's say the big 11 it it has i think it's like 4k for first or, or something like I, I don't know what the exact sums are but like it you get double for first as you get for second mm. and and this this whole prize pool structure i don't think is is too great for for like recreationals or professional players, because you know when you play a, when you play a big tournament, let's say the big eleven, it's it's going to be a big tournament for some people. It used to be a big tournament for me. Um, you're always looking for what's up top. You're always mm. looking for what is the first prize. So playing for significantly less, and also that jump between first and second, because the pro because the prize structure is so different from what it used to be, is is not very motivating. I don't mm. think. So I guess those would be some of the changes that I would make because like on party, I think you have a lot more up top, like there's a 215 running now on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which has $9,000 up top. And I think, you know, I, I even get excited for that kind of a tournament, even yeah. after all these years, like 215 with 9K up top on one of these off peak days is is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like when it's not Sunday or series, it's it's great. Like it's, it's you know, you feel like you're making a good investment, but if you're playing like uh like let's say the big 215 which i which i think should have died you know ages ago which is a 215 that has 20 buy-ins to fast or something it just feels ridiculous mm. yeah that's true so so i guess the, the way i would the way i would approach it actually is i would be more aggressive about that too i would make 
quick at changes. If something isn't working, I would try something new and I would play around with it a lot more because like you, you, you do see tournaments that have really gained a lot of success, like the Bounty Builder 530, you mm. know, huge success tournament. So I would just be more aggressive. I would try things out um, yeah. and, and play <clears> around <throat> with it a little bit more, try out some new reward systems and, and, and so on. But it's, it's easy to say, you know, yeah, for me, yeah. I don't know what's really happening on the inside. I, I don't know, you know, what kind of, and I'm sure that they're having struggles and stuff and, and they want to do certain changes, but they just can't do them for X, Y, and Z reasons. Yeah. So I'm always trying to put myself in their shoes and realize that it's not as easy as we just think it is. Yeah. But, um, what are the tournaments you personally like the most and which tournaments would you recommend people playing that according to your opinion, have the highest EV of playing? What tournaments do I like the most? Well, I used to have like favorite tournaments like the Super Tuesday mm. and, and the Thursday Thrill and so on, but now I don't I don't really try to attach myself to certain tournaments and just try to play every tournament as good as I can and just try to play my best strategy and focus on that. So but but I, I would say probably like, you know, obviously the highest stakes tournaments they excite me because playing against some of the best players in the world is is the most stimulating and the most beneficial to me because you know if i'm going to be playing against let's say someone who is a recreational it's going to be a fun experience i'm going to learn things but then if i play against you and i'm put into really tough spots i'm going to grow a lot faster i'm going to learn a lot more and i'm mm. going to be able to you know find a lot of enjoyment in that because to me it's in it's it's very enjoyable when i get put into really tough spots and i really have to rethink my whole strategy my whole approach and uh on the get-go come up with you know good solutions and and just be really present in the moment trying to play my best poker so yeah i think those those for me are the most most enjoyable tournaments like the the big game on party i think is is a good one that i really really enjoy playing that you recently took down and um and then the, yeah and then then obviously like scoop and and the series and stuff but I, I enjoy every tournament. Like every tournament that I register, I just just try to play my best, and try to try to enjoy it as as much as possible. So, which ones would you recommend in terms of value? Or maybe which ones would you necessarily recommend to to, yeah, build a bankroll? I mean, obviously, when it comes to tournaments, I think it, it goes without saying. Like the 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 ones with the higher guarantee are always going to be the better investments. Hmm. So. And, and the ones with, uh, you know, a good structure to them. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's tough to recommend specific tournaments because it depends so much on your skill level, your bankroll, <laughs> and, and all those kind of things. But I think, like, you know, like 109 that has 100K guaranteed, whenever these kind of tournaments run, or 60K guaranteed, these, these ones are great for guys who are playing yeah. mid-stakes, low-stakes, because the average, you know... The, the, the average um, level in this tournament will be a lot lower than if you take like 109 that's 20k guaranteed obviously yeah so, so in general a slower structure higher guarantees maybe avoiding tobos and hyper tobos and then um, screening for these kind of tournaments across all sides would be the go to go or yeah it, it, it depends a lot on your skill set I think I think some players are obviously better at tobos and hyper tobos as well so it's it's tough to say but I think you know, obviously the rake is is too high for the for the hypers and, and the turbos. Like there should be a difference in a rake because you're getting less for the money that you invest. So it doesn't make sense that it's the same rake that you pay for playing a hyper or playing a turbo that yeah. you play than if you play a rake speed tournament. I just don't think it really makes sense. And I and I'm not sure what do they in, in live tournaments do they actually charge you less rake? I can't remember now, but maybe maybe they No, I think more. Okay, more. I think right. more. It's, it has either, to be right. The either, expenses either, are higher. Either way, that, that's that's what I would change because, uh, yeah, because you know you have a lot more value playing in a, in a slower structure field, especially if you're a professional poker player. So, yeah. Are we going to see you live somewhere soon? Playing live this year, two twenty. Um, I'm I'm going to go to Barca for sure. I assume you're going to be there as well. Uh, I I intend to. But things yeah, can I mean, get there's the, the, there's, yeah. there's the big big 25k so definitely gonna play that one but i i'm similar to like uh well shout out to pads i'm similar to, to patrick and 
and these guys in the regards to the live poker, it's, it's not the most exciting for me. And I, I also feel like there's, you know, quite a lot of stress to be mm. in a certain way and you have to, uh, like keep up the posture. And I, I wouldn't say that I'm the most experienced when it comes to live poker. And also, you know, you get away from your routines, you get away from, you know, just being a really good schedule. Obviously, my, my girlfriend, she works full time, so can't mm. go with her every time. So you, you, you lose that mm. side of things as well. And, and uh, so I enjoy it on occasion, but I wouldn't say that I'm, I'm the most excited about, about live poker. But I think I have very good reads when it comes to live. I might be giving off quite a lot of stuff myself, but I think I have very good reads and very good uh, understanding of, of when other people are giving off tells and stuff. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's, that's definitely one of my strengths. I can I can confirm that, at least from what I've seen in uh, playing Werewolf with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was quite fun. For yeah. those of you who don't know what Fair Werewolf is, Google it. If you're in a big group of people, uh, you can literally grind it 10 hours in a row and time flies by and uh, exactly, yeah. it's it's a, it's an insane game it teaches you a lot about group dynamics reading tales um, and also teaches a lot about yourself when you are in a stressful situation i think it's very beneficial to um, also train your yeah your self-awareness when being in pressure and uh yeah yes. <laughs> You, you were definitely put in some tough spots in, in Budapest. It wasn't easy for you yeah. when, you were in the, when you were in the 300 game and you were standing up and there was a huge crowd around you. It's, it's not easy to be yeah. put in that spot. And it's the same thing with live poker. And that's why you have to give all the respect to the guys who are grinding, you know, the high rollers and are constantly traveling from place to place. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I think the same thing goes for people who stream poker online. I think it's like, mm. it's very admirable what yeah. they do. And also they, they help the poker community thrive and, and, and they bring more awareness to the game and stuff. And I think a lot of these people, they aren't really given thanks for what they do, but I think they definitely deserve it. And they, they deserve a big, you know, big thumbs up. And, and, uh, it's, it's not as easy as it might seem. And I think a lot no, of people are very, very easy to give them a lot of negativity and a lot of shit, yeah. but actually they, they, they deserve a lot of praise because they, if anything, they're helping our community grow. <clears throat> and uh, they're also giving other people like the, the viewers, like the viewers a positive experience watching them because yeah. you know most streamers, they're just very, they're, they, they need a certain personality to be able to stream. They, they have, uh, you know, yeah, just just a certain amount of positivity and, and optimism and and also knowledge for the game, obviously, to be able to play and at the same time talk through your thought process is not an easy thing to do. Have you ever considered streaming yourself? Um, no, I, I, I don't really enjoy that that side of it because like when I when I play a poker session, what I do is I just I play nine tables <clears throat> and I have no music. Mm. I have no I have no sounds, nothing. It's just complete quietness and I'm just trying to be hundred percent in the game. Yeah. You know? And I've always said this to our guys, but I think in poker, the best poker player is always gonna be the most present player. Mm. So the person who can be there in every moment and be ready for whatever is, is coming up. Because in poker like if you if you miss that you know if, if you're one second too late mm. and you miss something that you could have read into you might miss the opportunity to win the tournament like yeah. th this is how small like how how, how small the um the difference is to you potentially being successful in a single tournament so i i always try to be in in there 100 percent, and obviously it's it's not possible to do that 100 percent of the time but I try to do that with, you know, uh, preparing for my sessions in a good way. And um, also when I do actually play just complete quietude. So, so nothing really going on. How do you prepare for your session? Um, what, what I've been doing now is I've been going through things that I've studied. So not going really deep into it, but just like I, I take a lot of notes from what I study. So just going through the notes and reminding myself of why you know we're doing the things that we're doing again and then potentially like 
if if there's let's say I played yesterday and, and there's like some hands that, that I haven't gone through yet, I'll go through the hands and, and look through them and and not go through them in great depth, but just spend like thirty minutes going through them on the surface because I think you know, studying really intensively and going really deep into things is one thing, but that shouldn't be used as your warm up. Your warm up mm. should be something that gets you into the setting to crush. Yeah. And not going so deep into it that you're actually drained when you start your session, you know? <clears throat> yeah. But that, that's one thing. Another thing is uh, I'll work out, you know, play football or play paddle or, yeah, just just do something like that. And when you run deep <clears throat> in tournaments and very often the focus isn't there it is as it is at the beginning of the tournament, how do you approach final tables, especially from the mental side of things? Um, yeah, so I, as I said, I do a lot of deep breathing. I think mm. that helps. And I also just, you know, try to see it as, as something that's just, like, <clears throat> just, you know, it just is like I'm on the final table. I'm going to do my best to play my best, but I don't have really, I, I well, okay, let's put it this way. So I used to have huge expectations. Mm. Like when I, when I was top 16, I was always thinking in my head, I'm going to win. Yeah. And I still have this this killer winners mentality. So when I'm when I'm let's say final two tables in, in a big tournament, I always have in the back of my mind that I'm going to win because I think it's important. I think it's I think it's important obviously to be realistic, but at the same time you do need to have this killers mentality that you're going to do everything you can to win. And that doesn't mean that you're going to stop playing like spewy or, or crazy or whatever. It just means that you're gonna you're gonna take every single opportunity. And take advantage of every single thing you can you can see to just put yourself into the position to win yeah. the tournament. And that that's something that I've always and I know a lot of people are against expectations. Like if your final two tables in the tournament, they're just like, oh, I'm gonna see what happens. Like, you know, if I come ninth and I played my best, it's fine. But I'm more like, you know, I'm gonna give it for 120 percent. Mm. And if I come ninth, I'll be sad about it for a minute, but it's all right. Yeah. Life goes on, you know. <clears throat> So I think that's that's more my approach than than just kind of uh, and just kind of accepting that whatever can happen. Kind of, I, I try to put the faith in my hands, even though yeah. it's not maybe the most realistic thing to always do. Expect the best and be prepared for the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this approach a well, lot. What, 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 what about yourself? That's how I pro. I never look at the payouts. I never know how much is at first. So for me, it's just getting first and then um, of course and also be pre being prepared when things are not going right like this is <clears throat> when I prepare my session uh, usually I meditate every day but on specifically before a session I visualize myself being in a lot of dicey spots facing a lot of suck outs and I just visualize how would I like to see myself reacting in those situations posture wise breathing Am I going to sitting like this, you know, like and clicking or am I going to be straight up focused, dialed in, looking at every single piece of information that can help me making better decisions. And that's, that, that's how I, that's how I've been sitting for most of the podcast. Now I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're actually sitting quite straight. I'm actually already wondering when, when does this guy move? Um, because you sit there all straight and, uh, no, all, all jokes aside. That's that's what I try to um, <clears throat> that's what I try to uh, uh, follow through in my routine, and I've learned this actually when I was flying. Uh, was a random flight from A to B. I don't know where it was, but it was a Lufthansa flight, and I spoke a little bit with a flight attendant, and she told me, and we, we were chatting a little bit, and um, she was <clears throat> very diligent with her tasks, like she was. Um, very very focused and very dialed in and, uh, and we were chatting and then she stopped talking to me while we were taking off and so I, sh I realized okay maybe it's not the best time to keep chatting to her and then she sat down she <clears throat> put her bed and then she told me yeah when we when we take off we have to be very focused because she told me the way they are trained is um to always expect the best that things are going well but prepared for the worst especially when th when you take off and when you land and this was a, a a very enlightening moment for me because uh, it helped me also understand in poker that you should always expect the best expect winnings expect uh, deep runs 
but always be prepared when things are not going so well. And this will take out the unrealistic expectations and also the downfall when you finish ninth and you were chip leader with 16 left. You know, it's like, oh, I had this huge stack. I was supposed to win. And especially this entitlement, which can be very detrimental to yeah, um, play a very good A game, to be entitled to win something, to be entitled to make more money than someone else. And this was, even though it was just such a small situation in a flight, almost a life-changing situation for me, how I approach poker, to be honest. And uh, yeah, and sometimes you have these miracle moments with someone else that they teach you something about uh, <clears throat> about uh, being a flight attendant that you can use for playing poker. Uh, really opened my eyes. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's an amazing story, and it just goes to show again how you need other people to succeed in this world and this life. You know, yeah. you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. So, and and also the fact that you were able to pay so much attention and, and listen to every word that she said and, and you know be a good listener in the moment which mm -hmm. which can be really tough yeah. you know and be able to take that away from the situation is is really really amazing so yeah, yeah very nice nice story and, uh, and and really good that you've been able to take that into your life and into into your game and everything thank you um, it's in general I think it's also very important to always have your senses out there what's going on maybe pick up something one last question i have for you though and then you're free to go start your session i know you're grinding today so i want to don't want to keep it for too long um when <clears throat> poker wouldn't have worked out for you what if there's something else that you would have enjoyed doing and also second follow-up question how would you have explained the gap in your cv to maybe someone uh in an interview uh what you have been doing, would you have been open about it? And how would you made it look good for you that you played poker? How does it, how might it be beneficial for a career somewhere else? Okay, th those are really tough questions. In, in all honesty, I mean, I have no clue what I would be doing <clears throat> if I wouldn't have gotten into poker because again, like I've tried to live my life always just the next moment mm. i've always tried to live that way and i've never tried to focus too much on past and future but if i wouldn't be playing poker i would probably doing something that would be you know some something that would be social because i like interacting with other people so you know i, I could likely be running a business of some sort and it would be something that would have a lot of human interaction because mm. i really enjoy that part that's that's something that i really enjoy but be having good relationships with our players, having, you know, an honest and open community where we can discuss things without having to think about what the other person thinks of you and just, you know, <clears throat> leaving nothing um, outside of the outside of the conversation or the discussion. Um, about the gap in the CV, I guess I would refer to what I've been doing in Bit B. So, you know, all the coaching, mm. all the like because i've learned so much about managing a business and you know like about human relations and everything so i guess i would put them to that and that yeah that that's pretty much what i would do but it's no situation that i can comprehend myself facing in the future so it's 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 definitely a tough question to to think about it's actually a quite common question um, where people are worried about, okay, if I go poker and I fail, I might have to find a new job. And some, yeah, I think some don't have, yeah, have I, a stable where they gain experience in uh, human resources, marketing, managing stable, whatever it is. So how, how yeah. would you just taking playing poker as, as a benefit for your career? Well, I think it d depends on your age, but for me personally, I'm young enough uh where i could just go and, and any anyone can obviously do it doesn't doesn't matter what your age is mm -hmm. but just go and study something and get good at something else well, obviously the older you get the tougher it is for you to get back into it and and get get into a different field but i think for me personally that's that's what i would do i would i would go and i would i would study something else if if i wouldn't have the resources to put a successful business together which yeah. would be the first yeah. goal because I, I actually have a lot of business ideas outside of poker as well which i am going to potentially execute at some point we, we don't have to go into detail about those now but it's uh it's just some some ideas that i've i've come up with um 
over the time when I've like, when I've been in poker and just you know whenever you're whenever you're really present and have that cre creative moment, you just come up with something yeah. and it's actually a good idea. I think one of the most creative people that I know is Pads, hmm. who just comes up with all kind of random, <laughs> amazing ideas, completely out of nowhere. And, and obviously, you see it in his poker game too. He's one of the most creative players, like always thinking out of the box and and doing something that most of the players are not doing and then you're like okay this is kind of weird but actually it does make a lot of sense mm. when you look deeper into it so uh, i think being close to people like that has also helped me to think more creatively mm. makes a lot of sense uh maybe we speak about that next time what are your future plans i really appreciate you taking the time I think that was an incredible value that you have been sharing here on the podcast and pretty sure a lot of the viewers can um, take a lot of the value for themselves and, and, and learn about uh, poker mindset, life and yeah, just continue their journey in a more positive and more confident way. So thank you so much uh, for, for taking the time and of course also good luck for your grind today. Yeah, th thank you very much for, for having me on and obviously it's <clears> nice to have a conversation with another you know human being basically so yeah it was a pleasure thank you and guys don't forget if you have a question um don't don't be shy drop it in the comments uh give it a like if you enjoyed the content helps growing the channel don't forget to subscribe and then see you guys in the next podcast bye bye